remember the 60s. This was something that Tim would always say to me. Tim was a member of the church I grew up in. I had a vibrant and passionate love for God. He came from a really difficult past, drugs and partying, broken family. But Jesus saved him later in life and started coming to our church. And he would serve diligently. He was at every event. He was such a gift and a blessing to be around. But a short time after coming to our church, his health began to deteriorate. An aggressive form of cancer was discovered and eventually Tim was placed in hospice. And at this time, I was just starting in vocational ministry and my lead pastor asked me if I wanted to join him in regular visits to see Tim. And so we would go several times a week and one thing that I'll never forget about Tim was his joy and excitement for God's word and in particular, the Psalms. Specifically, the Psalms in the 60s. See, every time he would say, remember the 60s. And there's a double meaning there. Because in the decade of the 60s, Tim was not a Christian and was doing his own thing. But like I mentioned, God saved him. And for that, Tim was incredibly grateful. And so the Psalms in the 60s, the chapters, reminded Tim both of God's presence and God's promises that were consistently available to him. And Psalm 61 was one of his favorite psalms, and it's become one of my favorite psalms. And in particular, verse 2. Verse 2 in the ESV reads, When my heart is faint, or the NIV, when my heart is faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Or the New Living Translation renders it, When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the towering rock of safety. All those translations are faithful and good, and they're trying to capture something of the beauty and the depth of this word that we render faint or overwhelmed. But for this sermon, I want to primarily use the word overwhelmed, because it seems to be the language that we most often use in our day. See, Tim was obviously overwhelmed with the sudden news of his cancer and then imminent death. But he always told me, every time we left from visiting, remember the 60s. See, a few years later, I myself would have an intense season of being overwhelmed. My own heart was faint. Many of you have heard us share some of our story. See, about six years ago was one of the most overwhelming seasons of my life. In the summer of 2018, we were about two years into planting a church. And to keep it short, I was not cut out for church planting. A cocktail of mixed motives, sin in my own heart, and not enough preparation and training led to us closing the church within a couple of years. And so six years ago was a season full of sleepless nights and long conversations. And by the time the church closed, I did not want to be a pastor, let alone ever plant a church. Overwhelmed. Faint of heart. That was the state of my soul. And so have you ever felt overwhelmed? I mean, what overwhelms you? I mean, what are you overwhelmed with this morning or what have you been overwhelmed with this morning? past week or even this past month. And being overwhelmed isn't just about the big moments in life like death or transitions. Being overwhelmed is a common occurrence when the to-dos are endless and when the relational tension is high and when the uncertainty about what's next looms so large that it's the last thing you think about as your head lays on your pillow and the first thing that cops into your mind as your feet hit the floor. Being overwhelmed is a low-grade simmer, something that is actually easy to hide, where for most of the day you might get by just fine. You're actually pleasant to be around. But then there's that moment, and you know what I'm talking about, where the coworker or your roommate gives you that one look or does that one thing, or one of your children does that one thing, and then you snap. And the reaction on your face and the feeling in your soul is all you need to remind you that there's something inside you that needs tending to. See, being overwhelmed is a common experience that we cover up in a million ways, from anxious scrolling to that extra trip to the fridge to checking boxes just to check boxes or a myriad of other responses. But the question I have for each and every one of us, whether you're a Christian or not, is simply this. What do you do when you're overwhelmed. 
David in Psalm 61 cries out, From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint or overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Again, that word faint, overwhelmed. And David says, When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. When, not if. That's the language of the psalm. Right out of the gate, the psalm is reminding us that we will be overwhelmed. If you haven't already, you will be overwhelmed. Happy Sunday. Let's pray. It's a when, not if. David knows this. The scriptures teach this. We need to be reminded of this. See, David's prayer is a preemptive prayer. David is praying for his future self, that in the future, whenever that moment comes, when I am overwhelmed, when that moment comes, God, help me. God, you need to do this. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And so when your heart is overwhelmed, where do you turn? When the deadlines are mounting up and when the schedule is full and when the relational dysfunction doesn't go away and when there's simply just too much to do with too little time, where do you turn? Is it to the fridge for that extra drink or one more episode to escape, or websites that you know you're not supposed to look like, or frantically doing things, hoping that if you can just change your external circumstances, perhaps then your internal world might be better. I mean, the list could be endless. But what if what you need is, in that moment, not a quick fix, not escape, not a brilliant new technique or a mindfulness app to calm your overwhelmed and anxious heart, but rather something simple, not flashy, time-tested, not new. Because in a more and more complex world, the longing for the simple yet transformative is only going to grow. See, for this morning, I want to look at this psalm in two movements. Two movements because it's how I see David structuring this psalm. Presence and promises. Two simple things. Again, nothing novel, but two simple truths every Christian needs. See, I want to talk to you this morning about the unique resources Christians have in those moments when we are overwhelmed. So two points this morning. Number one, when you're overwhelmed, remember the presence of God. And when you're overwhelmed, remember the promises of God. So first, when you're overwhelmed, remember the presence of God. Verse 1, hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. And don't miss what David is saying here. Don't miss what's, what's, what's underneath and the, the belief that David has. See, the God who created heaven and earth, the God who parted the Red Sea and made Israel walk through, and the God who got up out of the grave, hears the prayers of overwhelmed, faint-hearted people who simply cry out to him. He hears you. He doesn't just get you, he hears us. I mean, do you dare to believe that the God who made heaven and earth hears your prayers? Yes, yours. This is what David is appealing to. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my, my prayer. From the end of the earth, I call out to you. I mean, it seems like David is expressing that God feels distant from him. It's like David is on one side of the earth and he longs to be near to God, but God seems so far away. I mean, have you ever been there? Have you felt distant from God? God, I thought you called me to do this thing, to plant this church, to make this move, to take this job, or to say yes to this opportunity. Or God, I thought that our marriage was supposed to last a lifetime, but it's on the brink of destruction, or maybe it already has. Or the child that I've been praying for day after day after day is no longer walking with Jesus. Or the diagnosis comes back, and that's supposed to happen to them, but not to me. It's like you're on one end of the earth, and God is as far away as possible. It seems like God is silent. See, silence is probably the last thing we ever want to experience from God. Silence for many, at least for me, is exposing. It exposes what's really going on, what I'm really thinking or what I'm really feeling that I didn't know was actually there. But what if? What if God's seeming silence 
is a gift? What if God speaks in the silence? What if God's seeming silence is actually a reminder that God is present to you? See, when you're overwhelmed and when life catches up to you, is it helpful for someone to come in and just start talking, here's what you need to do. Read this book on being a non-anxious presence, which is only going to make you more anxious. Quote this verse from Philippians, and then voila! See, what you need in those moments, what you want in those moments, in those moments of feeling overwhelmed, is presence. Presence, not a lecture. Presence, not a three-step plan. And sometimes, many times, someone's presence doesn't require any words. But the silent, loving presence of someone you know, of someone you love, that silence speaks. How much more so with God? God speaks in silence because God is present in the silence. And so do you dare to believe that even in the silence, even in the seeming distance, God is present? But this leads David to long for even more of God's presence. He's feeling a little bit distant from God, but that's not how he wants to stay. Again, verse 2, from the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. When we lived in California, we maybe lived about a half mile from the beach, right on the coast. And there are all these signs that basically said, in case of tsunami waters, you better not be here. And I was like, well, none of us are going to be here if the tsunami comes. See, when, what you need in these moments of feeling overwhelmed, when the, when, the, when the floods come, when the waters are rising, you need to be on the high place. When the enemies are coming to David, when everything is overwhelming, the high place is the place of advantage. And David is saying, I'm vulnerable. I'm going to be swallowed up by these floodwaters. I'm going to be overtaken by enemies or people coming after me or, or terrible circumstances. I'm going to need a high place. I'm going to need a rock that is higher than I. And David knows that that high place is the presence of God. He says so in verse 3, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. When you need solace, when you need quiet, when you need to be restored and refreshed and rehydrated, where do you go? That's what David's saying here. He's saying you have been my refuge and strong tower. Notice the past tense. You have been. See, part of what empowers David is the fact that David knows that God has met him in the past, and so David knows that God's going to meet him in the future. David has cultivated a deep dependence and track record of continually coming before the Lord. God's track record is fueling David's present faithfulness. David is saying, God, you are my strong tower. You are my place of refuge. To be in your presence is the place I need to be. It's the place I want to be. Then look what he says in verse 4. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. Again, David says a loud and definitive yes to the presence of God. It's what he wants. It's his deepest desire. It reminds me of something the Puritan Samuel Rutherford said, Oh, my Lord Jesus Christ, if I could be in heaven without thee, it would be a hell. And if I could be in hell and have thee still, it would be heaven to me. For thou art all the heaven I want. Is the presence of God the one thing you desire above all else? Your circumstances may stay the same. The situation may not change. But external circumstances do not need to control your internal world. But the only way for that to happen is by being in and seeking and relying on the presence of God. And what David wants above all else is the presence of God. But let's be honest. With anything great... There's always an unexpected consequence, right? 
with every great offer, there seems to be some unexpected or unintended consequence. For instance, my iPhone. My iPhone allows me to store hundreds upon hundreds of contacts on a small little device. But I can't call my mom from someone else's phone, right? Like if the battery dies, I can barely get around the city that I live in or find a cup of coffee or let alone pay for that cup of coffee if I happen to come across a place. The iPhone has given me accessibility to so many things that were never there before, but it's also made me entirely helpless if the battery dies. Now, before you keep judging me, <laughs> I can navigate Omaha really well, thank you very much. I've lived here for so long. In fact, a few weeks ago, I told Pastor Dusty that my son's baseball games were in South Omaha, which my son's baseball games are at 120th and Q. which is just south of where I live. <laughs> See, <laughs> you never know how these things are going to go. <laughs> See, the unexpected consequence of the smartphone, and you're all with me in this, so don't, is that we're all pretty helpless if the battery dies on this thing. That's the unexpected consequence. And the unexpected consequence of the presence of God is that God's presence means we're going to be in the presence of others. When you say yes to God's presence, you are saying yes to being with God's people. See, let me correct and nuance myself a bit. Being with God's people in community is not really unexpected, or at least it shouldn't be. It's a vital part of God's design that's clearly revealed in Scripture. And again, the moment we say yes to God's presence is the moment we also say yes to God's people. And when David says in verse 4, let me dwell in your tent forever, the tent was the place where God's people gathered, where God's people collectively worshipped. See, if you're only looking for a solitary just me, my journal, my earbuds, and an ambient playlist in the presence of God, you will not find that on the pages of Scripture. To say yes to God's presence is to say yes to God's people. And a solo spiritual journey is a modern invention. So, when, not if, you're overwhelmed, we remember the presence of God. We seek the presence of God. We run to the presence of God. And that's not just a solitary experience. And neither is the second point. Number two, when you're over, overwhelmed, remember the promises of God. Now, at the end of this psalm, there's a set of verses, six through eight, that are really interesting. It reads, prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. See, what's David getting at here? I mean, isn't David the king? Well, it seems like David is drawing on something that God previously promised to him in another place in the Bible. Now, I don't need you to turn there, but I want to quickly mention another moment in David's life from his past. It's found in 2 Samuel 7. And for those of you who are newer to the Bible, I'd encourage you to go home and read 2 Samuel 7. And even if you've been around the Bible for any length of time, 2 Samuel 7 is a chapter you need to have on speed dial. And yes, tangent, it's 2 Samuel 7. <laughs> because there's no N or D next to the 2. <laughs> See, if I were to write an article, 10 Old Testament chapters that you need to have in their back, Christians need to have in their back pocket, 2 Samuel 7 is going to be up there. It's one of the most important chapters in all the Bible. Why? Because in this chapter, God promised to David that he would raise up one of David's descendants and that God would establish the kingdom of this descendant forever. And that when this descendant becomes king, God's enemies will be destroyed. And when this descendant becomes king, all the promises of God will be fulfilled and all of creation will be as it should. Again, this is all found in 2 Samuel 7. And so that brief summary, let's relook at some of these words in Psalm 61. Prolong 
the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. So you know what these statements are about? These are poetic ways that David is praying that the king you promised to me, God, would he reign forever? And this is what David is saying to the Lord, keep the promises that you've made to me. God, make everything right under the reign of this true king. And David prays in verse 7, may he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. Literally that phrase, may he be enthroned forever, is may he sit forever before God. Which is surely an echo to Psalm 110, the most quoted passage in the New Testament of the Old where it says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. May this king sit. May this king be enthroned. The world may be going crazy, but if there's a king who's sitting, if there's someone sitting on the throne, I'm okay. You're okay. We're going to be okay. That's what David is saying. David is praying that this future king would flourish and his kingdom would be established forever. But then look what he says in the last part of verse 7. May he be enthroned forever before God and appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. The last time I preached a few weeks ago, I asked you, what was the most quoted verse in the Bible by the Bible? Do you remember? Exodus 34. It's the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. See, when the Lord describes himself in the Old Testament, or most commonly describes himself, he does so with the language of steadfast love and faithfulness. And David is saying, may this future king possess and demonstrate the same steadfast love and faithfulness of God. And so I hope you see what David is doing here. He is rooting himself in the very promises of God. He's rooting himself not in his own preferences or what feels good in the moment, in the midst of being overwhelmed. Relying on the promises of God is an anchoring point for David's soul. And in this world outside of Eden, we must do the same. When David was overwhelmed, he looked to the promises of God. When you are overwhelmed, you too must look to the promises of God. Do you know what? God has answered this prayer from Psalm 61. The king that's promised here in Psalm 61 is none other than King Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of God's presence. He's the fulfillment of God's promises. He is steadfast love and faithfulness. He is the king that is sitting on the throne. And he's the only one who's lived the truly human life that God has intended each of us to live, yet we perpetually fail to live. And on the cross, Jesus dies on our behalf and absorbs the collective weight of all the choices we make where we go and we run to other things other than God in those moments of being overwhelmed. All the ways that we seek escape or anxiously scroll or overreact or the million other ways we respond when we're overwhelmed. See, Jesus let your sin and my sin overwhelm him on the cross and in return, he gives back his steadfast love and faithfulness. God has fulfilled this promise from Psalm 61. And on this side of the cross and resurrection, God's people look with anticipation to what God will do one day in making all things new. He promises to bring heaven to earth, and he promises that his presence is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And so however many days God gives us, God is calling us to the simple things, not flashy, his presence and his promises. And because God has demonstrated his presence and promises, and God will demonstrate his presence and promises, David will respond in a certain way. Verse 8, so will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. 
Notice David's intentionality here. Notice David's commitment. See, do you know what we're invited to do when we're overwhelmed? It's simple, not novel. It's time-tested. It's not a gimmick. We're to remember the presence of God. We're to remember the promises of God. How? By singing his praises, by performing our vows, meaning we're doing the simple things, the practices that God's people have done for millennia. Now, what I'm about to say is vitally important. Lean in here. David's praise, David's commitment is a response to the presence and promises of God. Because God has and God will, I will. See, sometimes being overwhelmed pulls us away from the ordinary means of grace. But when your heart is overwhelmed, where do you turn? When the deadlines are mounting up, when the schedules are full, when the relational dysfunction doesn't go away, when there's simply too much to do with too little time, where do you turn? See, what if what we need in that moment is not a quick fix, not an escape, not a brilliant new technique or a mindfulness app to calm our overwhelmed hearts? We don't need to just do things just to do things, check boxes just to check boxes. See, we often think we're too tired, too stressed too overwhelmed to just show up, to show up for worship, to show up for small group. But actually showing up for worship is the the very thing we need to do. It's how we express faith and trust in God's presence and promises, what faith looks like in the ordinary every day. Or maybe to say it another way, I can't remember fully God's presence and promises in isolation. That's not how this works. The unexpected consequence that really should actually be expected is that we are reminded of God's presence. We are reminded of God's promises with God's people. To say yes to God's presence is as yes to God's people. And I am reminded more fully of his presence and his promises as I gather with his people singing his praises, performing our vows, and practicing the way of Jesus together. This is corporate, not individual. It's us, not me. So, we don't make hasty decisions. We don't panic. We don't overreact. We don't overfunction. We just keep doing the next right thing, singing praises, keeping our commitments to God's ways, doing the little things day after day. And when, not if, when we are overwhelmed and fall short, we can simply turn back to him in repentance and faith and receive his overwhelming love and grace. See, because God will, we will. David's commitment is a response to the presence and promises of God. Verse 8 again, so will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. God's kingdom is here and it's coming. Jesus, if you are in him, has made you new and is making all things new. So when, not if, our hearts are overwhelmed, may God lead us, may God carry us to the rock, the king of kings, that is higher than I. And may we, if we can, remember the 60s, especially Psalm 61. God, we thank you. We thank you so much for your steadfast love and faithfulness to us. God, thank you that when we are overwhelmed, we can come to you and that you lead us back to yourself that you do not leave us nor forsake us. God, would you have mercy on us and forgive us for all the ways that we turn to other things when we're overwhelmed. May right now, Spirit, in this moment, would you remind your people, would you remind me of your steadfast love and faithfulness to us? Despite all the directions and things that we turn to, God, would you... Just be big in our hearts and our minds and our imaginations this morning that we would be so captivated by you that it would just be just the instant reaction 
for each person here that when we are overwhelmed, we would turn to you. And would we experience your overwhelming love and grace day after day after day. God, we love you because you first loved us. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.